Good day to all. This is our discussions involving audit of cash and financial instruments. I very well know that you were done already with your financial accounting and reporting, especially with part one and the intermediate series involving cash and cash equivalents or the financial instruments as we all know of under IAS 7. So I understand that it's just a review, but let's see and let's find out in terms of audit aspect. So let's begin with first objective. Identify the major types of cash and financial instruments accounts maintained by business entities. So these account titles are affected by the cycles that we've had and what are these specific accounts. So for cash, we have these terms which we have known since from the very beginning, cash available for all uses or purposes, impressed, for example, for other purposes, but then for petty or small or minor expenses, we have petty cash fund. Bank account maintained in the branch is branch bank account. Cash equivalents are those short-term highly liquid investments, normally with a term of 90 days and can readily be available for cash purposes. Then financial instruments are those instruments which are more than 90 days, but then normally also short-term, so one year or less but not 90 days or less and can be converted to cash in such a cycle. Okay, so for general cash to other cash accounts, we have to take note that before we set up these particular items, normally they are cash at the very beginning, but cash is used to obtain such, either transfer to such or acquisition of cash equivalents. Then show the relationship of cash in the bank to the various transaction cycles. We have to take note that cash in bank, whether on debit and credit, will be affected by the cycles. Debit normally for all items involving collections or receipts. Examples of that will be collections of accounts receivable coming from credit sales and collections from cash sales. For the payments, of course, we have to look into the acquisition and payment cycle in terms of payment of accounts payable. And for the other liabilities in capital acquisition and repayment, normally long-term liabilities. Then for payer and personnel will be payment of the salaries, expenses, as well as the accruals related to such benefits and commissions and the taxes payables. Then objective three, we design and perform audit tests of the general cash account. We have to, again, look into this particular flow, understanding the client business risks, the performance materiality or tolerable misstatement or materiality level, control risk for the cycles affecting general cash, then the TOC and the STOT for those several cycles. Also, we perform AP or analytical procedures, test of details of balances in order to satisfy the balance-related audit objectives or management assertions or representations, which would affect these four items. Then this is an example for a schedule for a bank reconciliation that we as auditors could also check or verify. Although bank reconciliation is a primary responsibility of our clients, so all we have to do is to audit or verify if the values there are correct and the amounts are presented correctly or the items are presented correctly or accurately. Then the cash in the bank, remember, is, of course, as treated as important cash item or the most important cash item because this is very liquid and this is now the demand in today's time or modern era that we have to enter into transactions using cash in bank in the form of checks or online transfer, bank transfer. So misstatements can really happen. And also in relation to transaction cycle, it's possible that some misstatements may not be discovered with the audit of the bank reconciliation. Example of that would be failure to bill a customer. So this is really like intentional or unintentional omission of the billing. Therefore, no accounts receivable for credit sale or no collection from a cash sale. So it would have impact on cash. Then embezzlement of cash receipts from customers. It's possible that the cashier in connivance with an accounting staff would be hiding a certain collection. So without such recorded, of course, cash is understated. And then without cash being really kept in the votes, 
in the banks of the company. So cash in bank would be understated. Then misstatements as continued, there would be duplicate payments. It's possible, whether intentional or unintentional. Then personal expenses, which should not be mixed to the business, are paid from the company's coffers. Then we paid for raw materials, which are not actually received, hours not worked, and excessive interest to related parties. So overstatement of expenses. Then misstatements, which are normally discovered with bank reconciliation testing, will be, for example, for the outstanding check. Outstanding checks are checks already recorded in the books of the business. They have been issued with checks, but not yet cleared by the bank. So normally the bank would be clearing this sometime or a day or days later because that would be subject to clearing procedures or processes. Then one example also, if let's say cash was received already by the client, but then this was recorded in the wrong period, most especially with proof of cash or two date bank reconciliation, we're in certain cash transactions could be recorded in other accounting periods, let's say months, or window dressing, for example, to improve the financial position of the company. So cash is intentionally misstated or cash items or transactions involving cash would be recorded in the wrong accounting periods. So if you would like to have favorable accounting or financial positions, so normally you want more cash. So cash sales or collection from the accounts receivable in the next period are recorded in the current period. So those things, including also deposits in transit, which is the third one, meaning deposits already made by the business, but not yet recorded in the bank. Also, if there are payments already on the notes payable, which are debited directly to the bank balance, one example could be auto debit. So the bank was already deducting the payment, but then the company did not record that payment yet. So this can be detected by testing the bank reconciliation. Now, we also have balance-related audit objectives or management representations in terms of cash, and this has been discussed exhaustively. But then we'd like also to know if the transactions that actually are recorded in the records have existed or those transactions involving cash that actually existed are completely recorded, the amounts are correct, they're recorded in the correct accounting period, and if we compute the details or using the details would be getting the correct balances. The procedures in terms of auditing would be, for example, to be able to make a cutoff bank statement. So we would be confirming some items from the bank. So bank statement would be needed and then also to be able to make the bank reconciliation. The types of audit tests to be used in general cash would be combinations of course of the four items that we have known. So these are the tests of controls or TOC, but we can notice that the TOC has been subdivided into two. We have the test of controls in transaction cycles because again, cash is affected by all cycles. And then also for the bank reconciliation processes, so that's TOC B or dash B then STOT, AP, and TDB to be able to have a persuasive evidence, both sufficient and appropriate. For a cash in bank, we can do three procedures. So to check cash receipts and disbursements, that is TOC for the transaction cycles, not with the bank reconciliation, substantive test, and analytical procedures. For the ending, of course, we can do the bank reconciliation process, AP also, and the test of details of balances. Should we compare the two groups? So the common only is the analytical procedures, which can be done in all areas, whether that's the detail or the ending balance. Then objective four, recognize when to extend audit tests of the general cash account to test further for material for rod. So there are possibilities that there are certain fraudulent transactions knowing that cash is the most liquid item. So we have to extend the procedures 
to very close to year end. And in fact, at year end, especially for bank reconciliation, in, in case there would be possibilities of material fraud. Then we can also do extended tests of the bank reconciliation if the auditor believes that the year end may be intentionally misstated, so it is possible to go beyond the cutoff period or end of the reporting period. And this is performed actually by the auditor. Proof of cash, as what I've said, is to date form of bank reconciliation. And then this would show that all recorded cash receipts were deposited. So this is, again, what is our target. We cannot keep the monies of the business inside the company premises all the time. Otherwise, the company can easily be susceptible to theft and robbery. And then in case of calamity, so cash would be affected or would be damaged or destroyed. Then deposits in the bank were recorded in the accounting record so that both balance per books and balance per bank would be equal. Also, recorded cash disbursements were actually paid by the bank. So checks issued by the company have been cleared by the bank. And then all amounts that were paid by the bank were recorded to be able to have reconciled books and bank records. Then this is an example of proof of cash schedule. Normally, we have five columns. These are the particulars or items. And four columns involving the beginning balance of the previous month and then receipts or collections, which are additions, then disbursements are minuses to get the ending balances. As discussed exhaustively in Intermediate Financial Accounting and Reporting Part 1, or Financial Accounting and Reporting, of course. So the ending balance normally is also the date or the date line of this is the date also on the bank reconciliation statement that is to date, which is proof of that cash rather schedule or again proof of cash is actually a two date bank reconciliation statement but then are you aware that you can also perform three dates or four dates up to more that's actually discussed by Milan in his book so you can actually visit that in his book intermediate financial accounting and reporting part one again to highlight the current date here for the ending balance is also the date line for the proof of cash. Now the proof of cash would include the following reconciliation tests, that the balance on the bank would be equal to the general ledger balance. So balance per bank and balance per book or books would be the same at the beginning. Otherwise, you would not be able to equate or produce ending balances which are also equal per bank and per ledger. Then cash receipts deposited per the bank with a cash receipts journal for a given period. So deposits per bank and cash receipts in the book would be equal. Also for the disbursements in the books and payments in the bank, electronic payments and even canceled checks clearing should be equal so that the ending balances would be equal also. That's number four per bank and per book or ledger. Then these are the enter bank transfer schedule so we can notice that if these are the banks connected to the company so we have here the receipts so receipts also with the bank and then as recorded in the books and as received by the bank disbursements as recorded in the books and as dated because that is paid already by the bank so by comparing the two it's possible that you'll be able to detect or check unrecorded transactions on both ends. For example, in the part or on the part of the bank, we have the outstanding checks for the deposits in transit. While for the part of the books or the company or client, we have also the credit memos and the debit memos. So debit memos could include the auto debit payment. Again, so much has been discussed about this in other courses. So please refer or go back to that. Our focus would be the auditing aspect. This could be one of the working papers of the auditor. Then interbank transfers would show accuracy of the information and the information should be verified. So as, or for us to say that such is accurate, 
then interbank transfers must be recorded in both the receiving and disbursing banks. Since, again, interbank, so bank-to-bank -bank transfer, who or what received such money or transfer or money transfer and who paid for that. Of course, the payment is prior to the receipt. Then the date of recording of those transactions for both banks. Otherwise, this will be a concept or this will be a concern of the so-called kiting. If lapping is applying collection coming from one customer to another for jointly, kiting is one way of, for example, a cashier hiding the deposit or the withdrawal. So, for example, if there is a transfer close to year end or end of the accounting period, normally that will be cleared the following day or days then. And then good if the next day would be a business day, but what if that is a holiday or non-working day or etc. So in that case, that would be cleared the next day or days then. So in that case, it's like a kite. You are actually letting go of the payment or money, but you are still holding of it. All right. Then disbursements should be correctly included or excluded as outstanding checks. And the receipts should be included or excluded as deposits in transit. These two are on the part of the banks. Then number five, we also design and perform audit tests of the financial instruments accounts. So again, these are the short-term investments that are having the outstanding or maturity dates beyond three months, but less than one year or equal to one year. So example of that would be the market money placements, the certificates of deposits, the treasury notes, and so on. So we'll have to assess also the following items and to do the audit of the said accounts. If you can recall, we actually perform these steps also. So we understand the risks. We set materiality level for the tolerable misstatement or performance materiality. We assess the inherent risk and control risk. And then we design now our procedures to be able to gather persuasive evidence, both sufficient and appropriate in the form of TOC. Then the details of balances and analytical procedures. So what is not shown here is the substantive test of transactions. All right, so this is the end now of this particular discussion. Hopefully you learned something. Thank you very much for listening and God bless us all.